What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke, aka Dansquake here, and welcome to the continuation of the Final Fantasy VIII Attack Only Challenge. Now, since I shared part two with you guys, I've spent a lot more time actually playing through and recording. And from a personal standpoint, it's turned into one of the most interesting ones that I've tried so far. And so over the coming episodes, I'm going to do my best to kind of convey everything that I've experienced and that I've tried and that I've managed to do in the most coherent way that I can because it has been quite the journey so far. So let's get into it and continue the story of Final Fantasy VIII and see how far we can get by using attack only and absolutely no junctioning. At the end of the last video, we had basically completed all of the train mission stuff and we ended up in Delling City. And so we are starting to gear towards the end of disc one here. And things are gonna culminate in the assassination attempt of Edea. And so what I'm gonna show you guys in the background here is basically the whole journey towards all of that stuff. And for now, I decided to just stick with the story and my general approach continued where I would try my best to just keep playing through the game. And if I did hit a wall, then I'd kind of go back and try to adjust things where necessary. And in terms of like a general philosophy of how to play through this, I think ultimately I decided to play it in a way that minimized the amount of grinding that I would actually have to do. But I wanted to demonstrate that everything I show you guys in a video is possible. So an example of that would be, for example, let's say there's a weapon upgrade that I want to make. Instead of just saying, well, upgrade this person's weapon to like the third tier using these, these items, it's more of a, well, can you actually get those items? And can I show that to you guys? And so I want to make sure that everything that you guys see in this particular series of videos is stuff that is possible. Now, does that mean I've spent every single second grinding and preparing and showing absolutely everything manually? No. And that's something that I've been open about from the very start, because these challenges for me are fundamentally about, is this thing possible? And it's investigating the answer to a question that interests me. And so that philosophy is going to continue. And so moving forward, that is going to become important because we're going to do some more of the, the level juggling stuff that I have done already in the playthrough, where, for example, a certain level, like a level average of the party, is not high enough, so we're going to have to get higher levels. But for example, when I need to do that, I'm going to make sure it's clear that I am in an area where I can level up and I can beat the enemies there. And so I'm going to do my best to present things in a coherent and possible way. But as I have tried to do from the start, I'm going to be transparent and talk about the bits where I've basically hacked in higher levels or I've prepared things a certain way to avoid sort of the repetition and the RNG and the grinding of being able to do a certain thing. So that's how we're going to continue to explore this question and this playthrough of Final Fantasy VIII. And so at this point in the story, Squall and Irvine are going to be together. And there's certain times in the story, of course, where the party splits. And sometimes you have control over this and sometimes you don't. And this is one of those scenarios where it's a forced party setup. And so let's see if Squall and Irvine can manage together. At this stage, to be able to get through the challenge up until this level, Squall has hit level 28. And Irvine, as he's a newer party member, he's still much closer to the base level that he arrives at. So let's see what the next battle is and how the party is going to handle it. At this stage, we get a lot of story. We have like the really cool FMVs, the parades, Edea basically gets rid of the president and then does her speech to the crowd. And so after all of that, we have Squall and Irvine taking on the two Iguions. I never know how to pronounce them, but that's what we're facing, the two lizard enemies, basically. And this proved to be already quite a difficult challenge. So let's have a look at how this one went. Here, we are facing two enemies that have a level cap of 19. So the first attack comes in. 69 damage on Irvine is not too bad. Like he can survive quite a decent number of attacks considering how low his level is. Now at level 19, currently my party average is 21 with Squall and Irvine. At level 19, they have 1,747 HP each. So a total of 3,400. Thankfully, they don't have like an undead status so we can do the full damage to them. But still, because there's only two of us, it could potentially be quite problematic. So obviously focusing my attacks on one of them, but they do have a move together called Resonance. So let's see the damage here. Two hundred and sixty damage, especially for Irvine. That's really bad. And so we have to try and crank through uh, this one thousand seven hundred as quickly as possible. 
So they do about 170 to 180 damage together. And then it shows us a third move called Magma Breath. This hits Squall. I think ultimately that worked out for the best. Because the longer that we have two party members instead of one, obviously the better it's going to be for us. So Squall took those hits like a champ. And let's see if we can finish them off. Because basically, I was thinking to myself, if I can finish one of them, then I'll probably be able to get the other one. But I need to make sure I, I can get through the first one and have enough in the tank left over. So after a time, they hit me with a second resonance and then a magma breath hits Irvine and he gets taken out. So we are left one on one. Squall with 392 HP and we need to take out this last Iguion to be able to get through. So it was a pretty close battle already. But at this stage, I was thinking even if I lose here, I think I can probably repeat this one and see if I can get one where they don't use resonance twice when they're together. And so I, I figured already like I should be able to get through this one, but I'd love to do it without having to attempt it again. So this was my first attempt. And let's see if Squall can do enough to, to finish the job here. Because what they don't have, like I say, is resonance anymore. As a result, only one being left. Uh, the speed stat is 8 at level 19 as well. And so uh, we do have a, a decent speed advantage here. Uh, I will talk about the, the whole turn skipping and the turn order stuff later. So if you remember, in the last episode, we did talk a bit about uh, some weirdness going on with the turns. But I have done a lot more investigation since then. And I will share what I know with you guys uh, later because it will come, it will become a bit more relevant. So Squall is really down to the bottom of the barrel here. He's one hit away from death. Can he survive long enough? That's two hits he's got. And it's just about enough. So with basically one hit to spare, Squall manages to get the job done and we make it through that forced double Iguion battle. So Irvine didn't make it. But as long as we get through, that's all that matters. So let's continue. After that forced encounter, we switch back to Quistis, Zell, and Selfie. And here, I'm going to show you guys a few snippets of the battles. There's nothing particularly interesting here. Thankfully, the three of them, even in attack only, no junction, they are able to get through. This is a matter of basically trying to get through as soon as you can without wasting too much time uh, going in the wrong direction and that kind of thing. So. One good thing about this game is that there isn't really like many things to pick up in terms of chests or items. So for example, you can pick up the weapon magazines, but um, in this day and age, all they do is they basically show you what you need. It's not that you have to have the magazine to get the weapon upgrade. So you can just ignore a lot of things here. And uh, in general, you should be able to just go through most areas in the quickest way possible. And it won't really affect your ability to pick up any like treasures or anything that you need. Obviously, draw points, if you were using uh, Junction, then yes, draw points would be quite useful. But at this stage, we're pushing through and we're still not using Junctioning in any form. So the way that's going to continue to work is basically for me to go absolutely to the limit, as far as I can, without any Junctioning at all, where I feel like there is no level of RNG that could really kind of stop this from, from being a wall and being able to get through. And then I'm going to do my best to basically not retroactively say, okay, this is how far I got. Now let me load up a save from 15 hours ago and then just go all out on the junctioning and then just go through. I'm going to see if with the setup that I have, the stats that I'm at, the levels that I'm at, the place in the story that I'm at, can I start junctioning there with the tools that I have and basically continue to, to do the attack only with being able to junction in the menus and stuff, but not being able to do anything other than attack during the battle. So that remains to be seen. Uh, we will get to that. There's going to be stuff for you guys to see before that, but just a heads up in terms of what to expect moving forward. So that said, I've shown you guys a few of the encounters here, and I think we can safely move on to the next significant boss battle in the run. And so after we make our way through the sewers and we continue the story, we get to the final battle of disc one. And the first of those is Cypher versus Squall. So the first of a few of these battles, and let's see how this one goes. Now, Cypher will cap out at level 19, and at level 19, he has 1,150 HP. And so this is not too much of a problem for us. You can see that we're generally dealing a decent amount of damage, and what he's hitting us with in return is not too much. And so he does have a fire spell, which started to worry me as soon as I saw it, and the damage is pretty hefty. But hopefully, as long as he doesn't spam Fyra too much, we should be able to get the better of him before he kills us. 
So at this stage, I was a little bit worried because one of the main problems we have in this game is that there's definitely a decent amount of battles that are back to back and that you cannot heal in between. And so when you're doing attack only, that's of course a massive problem. And so I was thinking, hmm, okay, I have to try and beat Cypher here. And then I have an Edea battle to finish off disc one. And she has 7,000 HP at her level cap. And so I thought this could be a big problem because I need to get through this guy with as much HP as possible but I pretty much can't do that because they almost trade turns one for one here and he's doing way too much damage for me to, to come into the second fight healthy. And so I was starting to get a little bit more worried about the back-to-back -back nature here and how I was going to kind of proceed through that. But then I thought, let's just do things one at a time here. Let's just get through Cypher and see how things are going to look against Idea. So almost there now. There we go. And so he loses, and it's time for us to get ready for the final battle of Disc 1. If we can make it through this one, we have officially gone through quite a big milestone in this challenge. So, let's see how it goes. First of all, I was like, am I going to heal between the, these battles or not? And the answer is no. So, Squall is on his own here, but then Renoa and Irvine join in. But he's only got 400 HP left, and I know that Idea has powerful spells. And so, already... I was thinking, crap, this could be a problem. But then I realized something pretty important. Most of you guys watching will already know this, but at this present moment of recording this, I had forgotten exactly how this worked. And the idea is that you cannot lose this battle against Idea. So you can beat her to gain additional AP points, but there is no way to get a game over from this fight. So at the time, I wasn't aware, like when I was first recording it. And so I was really panicked at this stage thinking, yeah, like this is like, there's no way I can get through this battle. But as luck would have it, the game threw me a bone here and uh, didn't necessitate that I win in order to make progress. So that was pretty funny. Like the, the one of the first battles where I was truly thinking, yeah, there's just no way we can get through this. Turns out there is a way because it's already scripted for you to get through. So I'm showing you guys in the background anyway, but basically you cannot lose this fight in terms of getting a game over and so that was a huge relief and with that I was able to complete the first disc of the game with attack only and absolutely zero junctioning so already that was pretty good progress for me uh, I was thinking can I even finish disc one without having to start relaxing some of the restrictions and stuff but we were still alive and the challenge was still ongoing so I was very excited to continue and continue on I did to disc two so without much further ado, let's continue on and see what I did next because disc two is where things start to get really quite radical and you're going to see some, some pretty extreme stuff happening uh, as I try to make my way through with this challenge and see how far I can get. So let's move ahead to disc two. So for disc two, things kick off with Laguna in Windhill. So I'm not going to show too much from the Laguna section, but I will show something of an outtake, which was uh, something that caught me off guard, because once we transition over into the Laguna part of the game and a new disc, I was like, surely the HP is going to reset. And I did not look at my HP at all. And so as a result, like I instantly got clapped and I died because Laguna obviously had 57 HP from what Squall had in the previous disc. So that's a bit cruel. Uh, there are times in the game where the, where the game automatically heals all of your HP. For some reason, this was not one of them, even though I think it should have been. And so aside from that kind of silly uh, first attempt, I was generally able to get through. So again, you can see in the background Laguna kicking some ass. Uh, maybe if you're unlucky, especially when he's by himself, you could potentially run into a little bit of trouble, like depending if you get sticky webbed very early, uh, some stuff happens. But I do think as long as he's basically close to full HP, He's strong enough to take things on by himself. And even so, he doesn't really have to get into many encounters before he can meet uh, Kiros and continue on. The Windhill section of Laguna, I'm not going to get into it too much because there's plenty more interesting things ahead. Just know from the footage that I'm showing you guys that he was perfectly fine with uh, Kiros to make his way through. And so we did that and were able to continue the story. So in general, the Laguna sections have been relatively easy. I've not encountered anything yet as Laguna that would have caused me trouble. So that might change in the future, but for now, the Laguna sections are pretty smooth sailing. So let's head back to Squall and the gang. 
Once the Laguna sequence is over, we return back to real time and Zell finds himself in Galbania prison. And this fight is one in which he is alone in a fight against the two soldiers. And once again, any time where it's kind of a single character, I'm always a bit more wary. We have level scaling and that kind of thing. So I thought maybe this is going to be a problem, but let's see how Zell handles himself uh, when he's on his own. Thankfully, you can tell very early on that they're not particularly strong. And so Zell is more than capable of taking these guys on by himself. Now, there are different level caps. Sometimes you fight these guys and they're uncapped. Sometimes they are capped. And sometimes, even though they look the same, there's kind of different variants of them that relative to their level are stronger or not. And so these guys are thankfully like the, the weaker versions. And so we didn't have too much trouble here. And so Zell is able to win that first fight and get our items back for us, which is going to be obviously essential in being able to continue with the story. And so once the party is reunited, it's time to face off against Biggs and Wedge for the second time. Now, this battle is going to play out a little bit differently to how it did the first time we met them. Right back at the start of this series, we basically needed to just get through them as quickly as possible by taking as little damage as possible to give ourselves a chance against Elvaret. So there was never any fear of losing against them, but this time uh, that could be quite different. And so what you're going to notice is that they're not doing like super damage here, but it could have been worse. So especially for Biggs, we are facing the lower level variants of his. So they cap out at level 22. And if it's that variant, he has 2,235 HP and 41 strength, which is quite high. But if you face the lower level variant, so my party was a 20 average, and that meant I could face him at level 16 as well. There's a 50-50 chance. He only has 1,939 HP, which is uh, 300 less. But more importantly, potentially, he has 9 less strength. He only has 32 strength. And so the difference in real terms here is that when he's at the higher level variant, he's doing anywhere from about 50 to 70 more damage with his sort of Gatling gun type attack. And given that this battle isn't super short, that can add up quite fast. And so especially for this fight, I think I needed to really encounter the lower level variants uh, to make sure I had a chance of getting through. So I did try the first time. Uh, I was unlucky. I got the higher level variants and that ended with a game over. Uh, but this one was the lower level variants. And this time I definitely had a much better chance of being able to make it. So definitely due to like the, the cap being higher, and them having quite a favorable scale, like in terms of strength and stuff, uh, it could have been quite a problematic battle. So once again, I went for Wedge first and thankfully managed to get through because he's the kind of guy where uh, if he's low on HP, the first attempt that I had, he starts to do these like desperation hits to do a ton of damage. And so they were doing 300 damage in my first attempt. Uh, thankfully in the second one, he didn't do that. Uh, that's generally how it played out, so it looked easier than it was, I would say. Uh, the first attempt, we got pretty much destroyed. Like, it started off quite well, but we got wrecked quite badly. Uh, but second attempt, thankfully, we managed to get through. Like, Zell literally basically has full HP here, and everyone is still alive. So, yeah, I'm not going to show the entire fight from here on, you get the point. But Biggs and Wedge were definitely tougher the second time round. And realistically, I needed to fight the lower level variants in order to give myself the best chance of winning. But thankfully, win I did, and we were able to begin our attempt to escape from Galbardia prison. Now, what I will show you guys is some of the encounters here. Once again, you're gonna be dealing mostly with soldiers. And as I've been saying all along, one thing I am allowing myself to do in this challenge is to escape random encounters when I want to. I have previously mentioned that in general, this game is one that doesn't really have too much in the way of like treasure chests and important items to pick up that are missable and that kind of stuff. But this place was actually a little bit of an exception. So I did have a guide up while I was playing through this bit. And I noticed that on the second floor, if you're willing to go down that far, you get something called a strength up. And so as the name would suggest, this is an item that you can use in the menus and it gives you a permanent plus one strength increase to one of your characters. And so obviously this is a brilliant way to passively increase your strength and do more damage in an attack only challenge. And yes, of course I did research how many of these can I obtain in the game, where can I get them from, can I farm them and all of that kind of stuff. Now there's good news and there's bad news. 
the bad news is that basically with the restrictions that I have where I'm not allowing junctioning and any of that type of stuff, there are very few opportunities to get any of these free upgrade items throughout the game. Basically finding them out in the field or getting them from bosses as a prize is very rare. And so it's not going to be like an absolutely huge game changer to be able to get these uh, extra strength ups and HP ups or any of that kind of stuff. So that's the bad news, so you're not going to be really seeing them too often, but they will pop up sometimes. And when they do, I'm almost certainly going to be using them on Squall, I think, because he's the one that can do the consistent 150% damage, and he's going to be the most present out of all of the characters. And so I feel like he's the smartest choice to use for Strength Up. Now, aside from the Strength Up, the enemies that you face here in terms of like monsters, this guy can drop stuff like Steel Pipe and Steel Orb. And so that's why uh, that was definitely something that I tried to do a few times to collect a few more items that would help me with future weapon upgrades. Another encounter I'm going to show you guys here is this particular one. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact acronym, I keep forgetting it, but basically this kind of mechanical enemy here. This guy can also drop you items that can be used for weapon upgrade purposes later on as well. I would say the Wendigo and this guy are probably worth fighting as you try to make your way out of Galbadia prison in order to get some more items that can be useful to you later on. So those are like important encounters. And other than those two, I think, and the strength up, that's the main thing I wanted to show you guys. Now, I have to say this bit was quite the slog, even if you're running away from a lot of the encounters. But eventually, I did make it up to the floor where Squall was, and I was able to continue the story with those guys. So after some more story shenanigans, we do get to change the party a little bit here as well. So I kept Renoa and Squall together, and I decided to have Zell join them because he was the most powerful of the characters that were left. Uh, I know that that would alter the, the level scaling a little bit, obviously we'd have a higher average party, but I figured Renoa is there at level 15, so she might help to balance things out a little bit more. And well, Renoa is so disproportionately powerful in this challenge, which is really great, and it will be a factor later, um, that I definitely obviously need to keep her around as much as I can in important battles. She's great because it's, it's all about like level to power ratio, and she is... Quite, she is by far the best when it comes to that. Like at level 15, she can do as much damage as her peers at like level 25, depending on what they have, or level 30 or something like that. And so that kind of power is very beneficial to us. Alongside that party, our secondary party here is Selfie, Irvine, and Quistis. Those guys are not as powerful as our primary one, but they do have a lower average level. And so the enemies are going to scale more favorably towards them as well. And so those guys as well, there was no problem, uh, especially on any kind of three-on-one battle or three-on-two or anything like that, uh, they were fine. So yeah, nothing much to report from them either. We just need to get out of this place and continue the journey. And so despite it being quite a slog to get up until this point, we were almost out of Galbadia prison and then we faced this forced encounter. Now, this forced encounter was terrible because these two mechs here they are uncapped and they scale alongside the party. Now putting Zell here, uh, because he's relatively high level compared to the rest of the party, was potentially a bad call. And I did not see this, uh, this particular encounter coming. And as you can see, they hit relatively hard. Now there's two of them, plus a higher level soldier as well. And so this could be quite problematic. He casts Aura on one of them, which is not good. Makes them even more of a threat here. Let's see if we can take them out, because the, the levels here are quite problematic. So, so for reference here, at level 25, they have 3087 HP each. They have 46 strength, and they have 31 magic. And so you can see that AoE effect attack is problematic as well. And suddenly, when everything was looking pretty easy, I was like, hold on a minute, this is bad. Now he's casting Protect on it as well, which gives me even less chance of winning. And so pretty quickly, I shut everything down here. I was like, okay, this was not the start we needed. I need to take out the soldier as quickly as possible before he gets those buffs on the mechs. And so I immediately gave it another go, this time targeting the soldier in the middle. And so yes, this battle actually ended up being the hardest one that I'd had in quite some time because those two enemies and their scaling was pretty difficult. And once again, by the time I took out the soldier in the middle, I was taking a lot of damage and there was potential buffs that they were getting before I was able to do anything. And so it was quite a struggle. And I thought to myself, maybe this is a point in which I'm gonna get quite significantly stuck 
and I can't really wriggle my way out of it potentially because I can't increase my levels any further. And so I thought maybe this could be a bit of a war. So this meltdown on Renoa was pretty nasty. Uh, she doesn't exactly have a huge amount of HP to start with, and so a move like Meltdown is definitely not good. But thankfully its allies are staying pretty still as you've seen, and they've got no attacks in. And so we took the soldier out first there, and we managed to do it without the allies getting any moves in. And so this was a really good start. We had been hit with a Meltdown, but I thought this is something that I just kind of have to, to deal with. Uh, she's probably going to die sooner than Squall and Zell anyway. And so yeah, it was time to set to work on these guys and see if I could get the job done before they took me out. And so now, I think because this battle takes quite some time and it starts to become relevant for battles of this level, I think it's time for me to share with you guys what I've learned about the whole turn skipping situation and what seems to be happening in this game. It truly baffled me. You are going to see battles coming up, and that's why I think it's important for you guys to generally understand things in advance. Like if you're, if like me, you're coming into the game as more of a casual, and it's not something you've really noticed before, because it can really quite wildly vary how a battle plays out. So basically, in a nutshell, the situation that I have observed is that depending on which enemies you're facing, and this is the vast majority of them, by the way. Um, there is basically a chance that when their ATB fills, they do nothing. And so the way that I kind of more objectively observe this is that when I play, I play alongside a cheat table. And this enables me to obviously do a lot of things very quickly and to save grinding time. It's a huge quality of life improvement for my playthrough. But what I noticed that the cheat table has is basically like a live feed of what the enemy's ATB is doing and it's represented by numbers. Now, when I'm recording, I record the game and I don't do like the entire screen record, like the, the numbers and stuff are very small, it doesn't work very well for it. But I do have a phone recording of the ATB and you can see what it looks like. It's not the best recording in the world, but it should give you an idea of what's happening. And basically, uh, with the ATB speed and stuff that I have right now, 8,000 is the number which an, a party member or an enemy needs to hit in order to have a full ATB and to choose a move. So what will happen, like observing as I play the game, is that basically the ATB will continue to increase uh, in increments. And once it hits 8,000, the ATB should stop because it begins a turn, like it takes a turn and it does some kind of animation. And whether it's like a basic attack animation or it's a spell, something like that, the ATB will, will freeze at 8,000 for say like one, two, three, four, five, six seconds and then it will start to cycle again. But what I noticed fighting against a lot of enemies is that there are times when, let's say the ATB gets like 7,500 and the next thing should be 8,000. It basically bypasses it and starts back from the beginning and it goes to like 7,500 and then say 689 will be the next number that you see. And that's basically a skip because it's reached 8,000, it's decided not to do anything and it's continued like this next turn. Now, if you ask me why this has happened, I have absolutely no idea. I found no explanation of this. I found no kind of analysis of this. I literally went through the Japanese Ultimania. I never found anything about it. Um, I've checked everything that I can check and there is no like objective information about why this happens. And so my immediate concern was like, is this some kind of very weird Steam version bug? And it's not repeatable, as you see me defeat uh, these guys here. And part of the reason I did defeat those guys is because they did skip a lot of turns. And so I'll continue to explain this as I show you guys uh, what happens for the rest of it. And so at this stage, I was thinking to myself, what is going on here? Is this like the Steam version? Is it some kind of bug where for whatever reason, sometimes the ATB almost like misses and there's some kind of element where it doesn't click, like it, it almost, it misses the full bar and it starts to rotate around. And so my first thing was to ask uh, a friend of mine and a moderator on the channel and a huge Final Fantasy VIII fan, uh, Syke on the channel, if you ever see him, say hi. Uh, he was a huge help for this challenge because uh, from basically like this session onwards or the session after this, things started to get really interesting. I really had to dig deep and learn more about the game and, and understand like this turn skipping and all of this kind of stuff. 
and Psych has been an invaluable help uh, for this particular playthrough. So lots of love for him on this one. Um, I basically asked him to see if he can check on his version of the game whether he observed any kind of skipping as well. And so he has the PS4 remaster version. And so it's a different enough version where I thought if he's seeing the same thing too, then at least I can conclude quite safely that it's not some kind of bug that's specific to the Steam version of the game. And thankfully, he basically tested it as well. And he said that I can definitely observe that characters are skipping turns. And one of the ways in which we did this was to basically just go into a battle, let's say against a very basic enemy like a soldier, just a single soldier, and basically time how long it takes between moves and check to see what the ATB is doing. And we very quickly started to notice that if you just sit in a battle and wait, most of the time, an enemy will at some point skip. And so what happens is, let's say, I don't know, if you average it all out, an enemy takes a turn every four seconds. There will be times when an enemy takes a turn every 12 seconds for some reason. And it was something that Psych also proved was the case on the PS4 version as well. And so to me, this was really baffling. It's basically, the only way I can explain it is like there is an RNG when an enemy ATB is full and it seems to decide whether it wants to take a turn or not. I've tried to influence this. So my first thought obviously was like, is there a certain attack timing where if you time it just when it's about to fit its ATB, it skips it or some kind of setup, some kind of arrangement, some kind of status effect, whatever it might be but I could not find a way to influence this particular thing. And so it really was rather baffling to me. And so sometimes, depending on how many skips happen, I've seen enemies skip as many as seven or eight times in a row. And so you can imagine if that happens, if every single skip, if you're trading turns one for one with the party, you can imagine what's gonna happen if an enemy chooses to skip six or seven times. And so you will observe in this series that there have been times and there will be times when you get a disproportionate amount of attacks compared to what your agility stat says. And so what I did do was basically use what's known in the Ultimania and all of the high level guides to basically run the numbers and calculate how long it should take for an enemy to take an action. And so not only did it work theoretically, it also worked in practice. So I plugged all of the numbers in like the speed stat, ticks, ATB, all of this kind of stuff. And for example, I ended up with something like um, the Adamantoy should get a turn every 3.6 seconds. And in general, when the Adamantoy doesn't skip, yes indeed, it's every 3.6 seconds. But because of the skipping, sometimes 3.6 seconds can become 15 seconds if it just decides to skip four times in a row. And there is no pattern that I've managed to find in terms of when it skips and when it doesn't. So it will look something like turn, turn, skip, turn, skip, 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 turn, skip, turn, 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 skip, 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 turn, turn, something like that. And there is just no rhyme or reason to why it does this. So that's what I would generally leave it with. You will be seeing battles in which it seems like the enemy is just sitting there doing nothing for ages. And there is basically no explanation for why this is happening. If anyone has any deep insight into why this is the case, you've managed to find something that kind of demonstrates that when an enemy's ATB fills, it can make a choice of not to attack, that would be great to know because I've not seen any objective proof of that. Everything I've done is through my own kind of testing, having a friend like Psych to help me out and Maester Erica from the stream as well. She watched a couple of my recording sessions. Uh, I streamed them for Psych and Erica and they confirmed what I was seeing too. I was like, am I, am I seeing things? Like, can we just observe this together and see what's happening? And they basically kind of corroborated everything that I've seen as well. And so it's, it's a mystery. It's genuinely a mystery. But I will say the final part of this whole thing is that the only time I think that I have observed an enemy never skipping, so basically every time its ATB does hit 8,000 and it does do a move, is when an enemy has like a preset hard-coded strategy. And by this I mean that, for example, let's say an enemy will be in position A and take three turns and then switch to position B, take three turns, position A, three turns, something that's very rigid. So it doesn't involve like a turn selection, basically, like it must happen on the fourth turn. If an enemy's attack pattern and style is very hard coded like that, it seems to be that the game obviously makes sure that that happens because if it skips turns, the potential of it skipping like a hard coded action is higher. So everything just becomes very rigid 
and it behaves as you would expect it to. But there's very few enemies in the game that do that. And so if there is an enemy that, let's say, that just has an attack pool of four or five different attacks, and it can use any one of those five attacks on a given turn, those types of enemies, they tend to have skips quite regularly. And depending on how many of them happen and how often, it really can make quite a big difference in a battle. Because as I've mentioned, if an enemy skips four or five times in a row, that could be an extra 12 to 15 attacks that you get on them, and that means a lot more damage. And so it's something that's out of my control, and I wish it wasn't the case because I could have a much more kind of objective look, like there's so much RNG at play already, but to my testing and to my knowledge and research so far, there truly does seem to be an RNG element of the ATB in this game that is not documented or analyzed anywhere that I've seen before. So hopefully this isn't like I've been completely on the wrong track from the start, but ever since Syke also confirmed to me that he was seeing the same thing on the PS4, I thought to myself, this is definitely something weird. So if you'd like to test this yourself, uh, I would say the best way to do it, like I say, is just to get a single enemy that doesn't have that many different moves and doesn't have anything that's very hard coded. So it can be a very generic, like it can be a wasp, it can be a soldier, any kind of singular enemy and just watch and see what it does. Don't do anything. Leave the ATB on wait mode as well if you want to. Um, I haven't tested it on active for the record. Uh, this was all done on wait mode. But basically, I was just watching and seeing the gap between the turns. And I guarantee you, if this is true across different platforms, across different versions of the game, it's not some very, very strange bug that me and Syke happened to find by accident, um, you will see sometimes it will almost seemingly attack back to back. Like we'll get an attack every two or three seconds. And there will be times where we'll sit there for like six seconds, nine seconds, 12 seconds, 15 seconds. Like you wait long enough, you'll see those pauses. And that, my friends, ended up making quite a significant difference. And so it takes quite a lot of explaining because it's something I've literally never seen before and I couldn't find any proper documentation on this. And so I wanted to kind of explain it to you guys as best as I could based on having played this challenge for like 20, 30 hours at this stage at least and to basically share my findings with you so that you at least have a reference point for the future. And then when we encounter certain bosses where turn skipping became a factor, you can actually understand what I'm talking about. And so, yeah, that was pr a pretty big detour, but I wanted to make sure that I talked about it as much as I could before we continue onwards. And so I say all of this because the next boss that we faced was basically the biggest roadblock of the entire challenge so far. The party needs to split up and one of them will head to the missile base. And so this is where we're going to sort of pick things back up. What we're going to do is to basically decide on two different parties and we need to try and make it through the missile base and fight Ironclad. So this is an interesting stage of the game because you do have some level of freedom. There are some blockades and stuff that will restrict you from visiting certain areas of the world but there are other ones that are still open and so you'll be able to face certain random encounters. You will have a chance to level up if that's what you want to do. You will be able to go into Delling City, you'll be able to upgrade your weapons and so there's a bunch of options available for you now at this stage. So there's a lot of different ways to tackle it. But as I said from the start, my first instinct was always to just push forward, see if I can complete things and if I can't then take a step back and this would be basically the step back that I take and I would try and do a different approach from this point forward. So let's see what happens when I went straight for it and try to get through the missile base and beat Ironclad. We are going to fast forward here to the end of the missile base section because I want to show you guys how my first attempt went. We've got Zell at level 28, we've got Selfie at level 25 and we've got Quistis at level 16. So this was the first kind of setup that I decided to go with. Okay, here we go. First fight against Ironclad. My average is level 23, and that means that I could face one that's at level 19, or one that's at the level cap. At level 19, Ironclad has 7,800 HP and 84 strength with 99 magic. So, <laughs> yeah, this was going to be quite a mission here. We don't have Squall here to do a lot of damage either. And so I was already quite worried at the damage output of this team. 
The one advantage we did potentially have was that the speed stat of Ironclad is always 7. And so if you factor in the skips as well, uh, basically there is a chance that you can get extended periods of turns against it. So you're seeing right now, for example, everything looks fine and dandy. It's just kind of sitting there. It's not doing much at all. And so if you do end up getting lucky with some skips, you can really build up some turns here and get some momentum. But when it gets a turn, you get hit with over 500 damage from its regular Gatling gun kind of ability. And so, yeah, this is the grind here. 7,800 to take out in a best case scenario with this particular team. And basically, every time you do about 20% damage, it ends up losing one of its turrets. And so that's generally the goal, to try to wear it down to its bottom 20%. And when that happens, you end up getting like two soldiers kind of springing out of it, I think. Two or three, I forget. It might be three. And then you have to try and take those soldiers out to try and finish the battle. And so things started really well because it just wasn't getting that many attacks. And so I figured, okay, maybe if we can keep this up and we get lots of criticals or something, maybe we have a chance. I don't know. Because Zell and Quistis can survive one more attack each here. And, well, Selfie can't survive anything more. But maybe we just get... We just get really lucky here. We'll just have to see how it goes. And so before long, the second turret broke, and I was thinking, okay, we're making progress here. I mean, getting towards uh, half HP, which is not too bad. And we just continue to get turns. You're seeing here, I'm just getting turn after turn after turn after turn. And so this was generally promising, because I thought this is the one reprieve that I do have. Like, its, it's attacks are very damaging, and relative to me, it has a lot of HP, but at least I can get a lot of turns in potentially. So you saw there, it said stand by for Beam Cannon. And so eventually, once you do enough damage, Beam Cannon comes into the picture, and you're about to see what that's going to do to my party when it hits. So let's see. I mean, for a first attempt, this was great. Like, I had a really good run here. Uh, it ended up being one of my best attempts. Like, I tried a bunch of different things, and this still ended up being one of the best. But Beam Cannon comes in and 958 damage. Absolutely beastly. And so I thought to myself, okay, you know, one attack does 500, the other one does 1,000. These guys barely have over 1,000 HP, like only two of them have over 1,000 to start with. And so things descended very rapidly. Like, we did well at the start, but then uh, this guy got mean, and the attempt ended pretty quickly after that. And so, yeah, that was my first attempt against Ironclad. And I was still quite a long way away. Like, to, to be able to, to whittle it down enough... It was looking like a bit of a tall task here. And so basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bypass like a lot of the different things I tried, uh, the different setups, the different levels and all that kind of stuff. And I will show you guys basically what I did once I decided on, you know, what was the, the right preparation and the right level and the right setup to have for this guy. So I will basically return with the, the run up to the win against Ironclad. But I want to show you guys my first kind of fresh attempt before doing that. Okay, so for the attempt in which I got through Ironclad, step one was to change who I had in my party. I didn't like having Quistis because Renoa, I felt, was much better kind of level to power ratio, and so I swapped her out for Renoa. So our party here is going to be Selfie, Renoa, and Zell. Uh, step two was to do some weapon upgrades. So this stuff I'll be showing you in the background, uh, which items I end up needing and basically showing you how I got those items very briefly. So the three main ones that you're going to see is something called the saw blade, and you can get those fighting Bell Hellmels outside like the missile base kind of area. They're not too difficult to drop, and so you can drop farm those. Then we have stuff like steel pipes, which I've talked about already with the Wendigo, which you can encounter. Then there was the sharp spike, which you can get from the armor dodo inside the tomb of the Unknown King. And finally, the first time that you can fight the Grendels, these guys scale very unfavorably and they get very difficult to defeat later on, and that's something I kind of found out the hard way. But if you kind of do your homework in advance and you start to face Grendels kind of the first time you can encounter them, 
then you are much more likely to be able to beat them. And I'm showing you guys uh, some footage of the Grendel being defeated as well at the lower levels. And if you do manage to do that as well, then you can pick up the Dragon Fin for Zell's upgrade as well. And so basically after all of this collecting of items for weapons, I managed to get some upgrades for Renoa, Selvi and Zell, which no doubt will help in the fight ahead. Now what I also did was to try and make sure I had a save before starting any item farming because what I don't want to do is try to rack up any unnecessary levels unless I really need to grind for them. And so if an enemy say takes like five, six, seven attempts to drop you what you need, I don't need all of those extra experience points. And so I basically kind of save reset uh, if I can get a win against an enemy to, to make sure I only beat it on the attempt where it drops me what I need and I don't get excess experience points. So that's the sort of stuff that I was kind of making sure I was testing out and trying to do it legitimately so that this stays a, a run that can be repeatable. And based on what I've done and what I've tested, everything I've shown so far continues to be possible. And so that was the next step to upgrade my weapons. Step three was where things started to get a little bit more interesting. Now, in the previous episode, we fought an enemy called Jero Jero, or Gero Gero. This guy proved to be a bit of an asshole because he was an undead enemy, and he was able to resist 50% of the physical damage that we could do to it as a result, which was a big problem for us. But then I kind of thought to myself, wait a minute, we could potentially use this too. Now, what I didn't know was how am I supposed to get a zombie on any of my party members? Because I thought if I get a zombie, that's basically almost the same thing as the sadness status that we had in Final Fantasy VII, which was so helpful in our attack only challenge. And so I had the light bulb moment of trying to go into this section with zombie and making like zombification like a general thing in this challenge. Now, it's definitely much harder to do and to implement than the sadness thing in Final Fantasy VII. First of all, you have to be fortunate enough to be in a region of the game where you can encounter something that gives you zombie. And thankfully for me, I was. So in encounters that you have against the Bell Hellmel, you can also encounter something called a Blood Soul. And this guy has a myriad of status effects, including zombie. And so once again, there's a bit of RNG farming involved here, but what you can do is fight this guy and just wait to see if it's gonna cast zombie on one of your party members. And if you get lucky, it will do it in basically one of its first turns or it will do it before any of your characters take any damage. Now that's already one reason where it's way more difficult than just putting sadness on uh, a party member in Final Fantasy VII. But the second one is that once a character is zombified, you obviously can't heal them again. There's no tricks that I've been able to find to be able to heal them. And that's a massive problem because that means that you can't use it as like this general catch-all kind of half, half damage kind of situation because if you have some forced encounters before you face a boss, they're gonna eat away at that zombie's HP. And by the time you get to the real boss, you're not gonna have enough HP left over to be able to tackle it. And so it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And so in general, the preparation still was to try and make sure I had some characters zombified before heading into the missile base. And what I ended up with was to have Renoa zombified and Zell zombified. I tried to get all three of them zombified, but it really turned into like a, a grind of RNG to be able to do that. Because obviously, if you already have two of them zombified, what this means is that every time you encounter uh, the Bell Hellmel plus a Blood Soul, you have to hope that the Blood Soul gets the first turn and that it chooses to use zombie on the person who doesn't already have it. And so it, there's a lot of things that need to come together. And so I think I tried for about 10, 15 minutes to try and get the third character zombified as well but I always ended up taking damage before that happened, like significant damage. And so it never really ended up being worth it. So for this particular battle, the, the idea was to try and have this party with at least two of them zombified and close to maximum health so that I could at least take 50% less damage from the Gatling gun. So the cannon beam will still do full damage, unfortunately, because it's magical, but at least the Gatling gun would do less and that would give me a chance to get this done. So that was step three. Then the next step was the inevitable making sure that I had a high enough average level to be able to defeat this guy. Because all of my preparations aside, when I'm close enough, like if my average level is close enough to Ironclad's cap, 
it was still too strong for me and I just couldn't handle it because that cannon beam just does way too much damage and it's too hot for me to handle. And so basically the step that I had to take was to spend time in the open world to be able to level up. And this is where, again, I've proven to you guys that I can fight everything in the open world and we can continue to kind of make our way through. And so, yes, I didn't grind it out for ages to level everybody up. I gave everybody some more levels in order to make sure I was able to, to grab the win. And so I ended up with Zell at level 45, Selfie at level 42, and Renoa at level 34. As previously mentioned, whenever I do this, I just basically linearly give them all the same amount of experience points, so that the gap between them stays the same. Uh, that's generally what I want to do at this stage. Uh, I can manipulate this further by, for example, deliberately KOing a character and then not reviving them so that only one specific character gets levels. But for now, at least, I'm trying to continue to level them all up together but retaining the same general gap between them. So to not drag things on too much, what I'm gonna say is that my master plan was in place, but the three soldiers that you are forced to battle before Ironclad kind of ruined everything because I had my two zombies, I had my upgraded weapons, I had grinded for levels, quote unquote, uh, I was ready to go. But these guys, they scale in a nasty way. They don't have a level cap. And so the more prep you do to be more overpowered against Ironclad, the tougher a time you're going to have against these guys. And once again, as I mentioned with Zombie, the trouble is that Zombie is kind of like a one-trick pony. If you're able to face a boss with no interruptions in between, then Zombie's great. But if there's like a, a precursor battle to it, one in which you're going to take almost certainly significant damage, then the point of having zombie is kind of worn off. And so these three were quite the problem. So obviously the idea was to fight Ironclad with two zombies, but you're gonna see here, I mean, the odds of keeping Zell and Renoa at like close to maximum HP um, before fighting them was just gonna be very difficult because these guys scale in a relatively nasty way. And so, yeah, let's see, <laughs> let's see how this went and how much HP I had left over by the end of it. So I'm not going to show the full battle because most of the moves you've generally seen before. In general, like you can defeat them, it's not a problem. But I was trying to once again defeat them with a lot of HP left over. But it's just looking so, so difficult to do. And so, yeah, it, it's something that I had to abandon. Like the master plan with having Zombie against Ironclad, I had to give it up. So what you're seeing here is one of my better attempts against the soldiers and they're really annoying with their potion counter attacks and stuff like that. I just could not beat these guys without taking significant damage, and so the whole zombie thing was uh, was a wash. I couldn't really use it for this fight, but it was a trick that I had in mind for the future, and you will most definitely be seeing me use zombie to great effect later on. But for the ironclad battle, it wasn't really an option because these guys just scaled too strongly and were taking way too much of my HP before the fight. So I healed everybody back up to max, and this, my friends, was the winning attempt against ironclad. At this stage, I tried it a fair few times, and so I knew that the timer being low was not going to be an issue. I just deliberately set it to like 10 minutes and just uh, let it rip. So I am significantly higher level than I was before, and that extra HP is going to come in quite handy. Uh, even though technically we're taking more damage because Ironclad is going to be, and his cap is guaranteed to be at level 22 now, um, the difference in HP that we have, and obviously the increased attack power, is going to be better. So compared to the first fight that we had against it, you can see the damage numbers here. And given the fact that there's three of us and uh, the battle's going to take quite long, it really racks up quite fast, faster than you might think. So you're seeing like 150, you know, 130, that kind of thing. You think, come on, like this guy's got 8,400 HP at level 22. Surely that can't be done. But I think of it, I started to think of it more in terms of rounds. So 130, 150, 170, it's like 450 per round. And so it means if we can do about 15, 16 rounds, we can get it so that the ironclad kind of breaks apart and the soldiers come out. And so that's that's the terms I've started to, to think in uh, more so. So Renoa now has enough HP to survive a beam cannon if it comes our way. And so I wanted to, to base my levels around that, like surviving a certain number of hits basically. And so keep an eye again on the turns, like see how frequently it's attacking and when it's when it's pausing, when we're getting like strings of uh, long strings of attacks in, that kind of thing. And you'll get a feel for the, the kind of things that helped here. So let's see, one attack, two attack, 
three. Four. Five. Six. Nice critical. Seven. Eight. Nine. Another turret breaks. I don't know if this actually ends up messing with the ATB. Maybe it does, but let's just keep going. Tenth move without seeing a reply. Now it comes. So ten moves and then beam cannon. Let's reset here. How many turns do we get before the next one? That's one. Two. Three. Four. Five. There you go. Five turns this time. Previously it was ten. So there comes the beam cannon and Selfie is dead. One. Two. And there you go. So this time we only got two. So <laughs> you see what I mean? Like that's an example of when the enemy speeds up. So it's it's not always like you can see how quickly it would kill us if it used a move every time the ATB filled up. Like the ATB fills up relatively quick because we're on high speed obviously as well. Um, but that being said, we just about managed to do enough damage to blow up the Ironclad. And now we just have to deal with these three soldiers. And if we can do that, we make a massive leap forward on disc two. Now, luckily for us, these soldiers are weaker variants and they do not scale that powerfully. And this was a massive relief because if they were the same as the previous soldiers that we fought, then again, this probably would have been impossible. You saw, I mean, Zell took it out in one hit. So these guys are kind of preset to be very weak. And so thankfully, as a result of that, we were finally able to put the nail in the coffin and get through Ironclad, one of the most difficult fights that we have faced in the battle so far. So those were the ingredients. Basically, uh, the zombie didn't end up being that beneficial, but I put Renoa into the team. I leveled up some weapons. And I leveled up, in general, about 15, I think, levels higher. 15, 16 levels higher than I was before. And that, alongside probably some good RNG. Uh, I don't think there was particularly insane RNG in this one, but I'm sure it could have been worse. And all of those factors together meant that we could finally get through this area. It did take me a long time. Like, what you're seeing here is a very abridged version. But we did make it through. And the challenge is still alive. And so with that, I am going to end this episode. And in the next one, we're going to head back to Balam Garden with Squall, Irvine, and Quistis and see if they can continue the fight and get us deeper into Disc 2 in Final Fantasy VIII. Attack only, no junctioning. So thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. These episodes are quite dense. There's a lot going on in this game. There's a lot to do. And even though the battles themselves end up being very simple, there's generally a lot to get through and a lot of prep work to do and just things to figure out as we move along. So I hope you guys have found it interesting. Uh, there's still a lot more to come. There's some really interesting things that happen in this challenge. And if you are enjoying it so far, then I have no doubt that you will continue to do so as we move forward. So thank you all for the massive support as always on these attack only series. Thank you to everybody on Patreon. As always, if you'd like to get early access to these episodes while supporting the channel in a huge way, please do consider the Patreon. It really does help a lot. And I will see you guys for the next episode. Take care.